everybody, and welcome to this evening's food season event. I'm Polly Russell, and I'm the curator and founder of the library's annual food season. Um, I uh, work with Melissa Thompson and Angela Clutton as guest directors, and they're wonderful. And Angela was, in fact, the inspiration for this evening's event, and also with Joe Allen, who's our wonderful assistant. Um, across the season, we try and cover all sorts of topics, the pleasures of food, food history, food and culture, but we also really find, think it's important to focus in on food issues. We've done sessions on food in hospitals, food in prisons, feeding children, and tonight's event is really part of that series. This question of eating for the elderly is incredibly important and something that perhaps doesn't have a high enough uh, profile, despite the fact that it will impact us all. We've got the most amazing panel this evening, and unfortunately, Joan Bakewell couldn't join us this evening because she was unwell, but I'm delighted to say that Professor Dame Carol Black has agreed to be on the panel instead. Dame Carol was, in fact, always going to speak this evening because she is the chair of the British Library. She's the chair of the Centre for Aging Better and Think Ahead, the government's training programme for mental health social workers. Among her many, many other achievements and pertinent for the topic this evening, Dame Carol is the past president of the Royal College of Physicians and the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. She speaks, therefore, with expertise and also authority about this subject. Dame Carol had previously offered to give a brief introduction to this topic, a kind of overview, and so she's going to do that and then join the panel. So Thank thanks you. so much, Carol. <laughs> Uh, well, good evening to you all and a very warm welcome. I do have one of the best jobs. Um, being chair of the British Library, let me tell you, is just a joy. I was born in a house with one book in it, the Bible. Now I have 170 million <laughs> books and manuscripts at my disposal. So this is absolutely uh, wonderful. I'm also pleased that I'm here because I'm well into the 60 plus age group. Uh, and so eating, um, I'm going to say for the older person, Polly, um, and not the elderly. I do not consider myself elderly. Um, so uh, uh, um, let me just start by saying the British Library food season draws attention to all aspects of food, as Polly has just said, from the pleasure of eating to the history of taste to the main food-related challenges that we all face today. Now, one of those challenges is eating by the older person. With an aging population, the challenges of ensuring that older people have access to good, varied and delicious food, a growing challenge that quite certainly does not get the attention it deserves. Of course, and you will know, there are multiple reasons why dietary health is a vital issue for the elderly. Malnutrition is significant risk for older people, many of whom live on their own and struggle with issues of mobility. And research has shown that malnutrition among elderly results in 65% more visits to the GP, 82% more hospital admissions, and 30% longer stay in hospital. Malnutrition affects our mental health and physical resilience and adds increased burden to our already very stretched health and care systems. But of course, food is not only about health. It can be a tool for conjuring memories, for bringing people together, and a source of great pleasure. I think we'll all agree that ensuring that older people eat well, whether they're living in, in independent places or in care homes, or in hospital, is a complicated, but I hope you'll agree, not an insurmountable challenge. Just to give you some facts and figures, the Malnutrition Task Force recently calculated that as many as 1.3 million older UK people are malnourished, or at risk of it. Age UK found that since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, 1.4 million older people have been eating less 
and 3.7 million older people have been unable to eat healthily and nutritious food. In older people, malnutrition is associated, as you will know, with long-term conditions such as problems swallowing, cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, dementia, and physical disability, as well as muscle wastage with increased risks of fall. People who are limited a lot by disability are approximately five times more likely to be food insecure than people who aren't living with a disability. The cost of living crisis has meant that 62% of households have experienced higher energy bills this winter, which has had a knock-on effect of how much money individuals and households have available for food. People on universal credit are five times more likely to have experienced food insecurity in the past six months than those of us fortunate enough not to be in this situation. Results from a recent survey of older people by Age UK are stark and show how tough life has been for many older people since the start of the pandemic. Lockdowns have left some older people with reduced appetite and less able to shop for, prepare and eat enough good food. Age UK is worried, and of course we all should be worried, that this is a hidden problem of undernutrition and malnourishment in older people and that it is increasing at pace. With nearly half, 49% of people who already had difficulty going to shops saying it's become even harder. And two in five, so 43% of older people surveyed by Age UK saying they feel less confident or even much less confident going into shops by themselves than they used to be. New data released by the Food Foundation showed continuing rise in food insecurity across the UK. Compared with July 2021, the figure has risen from 7.3% of households to 8.8%. That's 4.7 million adults in the past month. One million adults report they, that they or someone in their household has to, to go a whole day without eating in the past month because they couldn't afford to access food. Older Londoners are 50 times more likely to be experiencing food insecurity than those in the rest of England and, the, and London continues to have the highest level of poverty rates of any region in the UK. And of course, those two are, are related. So the Food Foundation calls on government to make food insecurity central to the levelling up agenda. So that's just some background figures. But tonight, we are joined by an expert panel with first-hand experience of working to help elderly people access nutritious and delicious food. I will be a poor substitute for Joan, um, but I will do my best. And we're really very, very sad um, that, uh, that she's not with us. Kath Dalmany, Chief Executive of Sustain UK, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming is the chair for tonight's event. Now, Kath has over 20 years experience of running campaigns and practical initiatives to improve the food system for health and sustainability <clears throat> and to tackle climate change. <clears throat> she helped run the campaign for better hospital food, is a long serving member of the London Food Board serves on the board of an aspiring farmer-focused local food trade network, and during the COVID-9 pandemic, led on initiatives to help families on low income gain access to initial food supplies. So I'm going to hand over to the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, yes, interesting. I'm so glad you brought up about the word elderly. Let's ditch it for the evening. Uh, thank you very much. That's good, because I'm quite sure. I was going to have a show of hands to bring that word out to say who actually wants to identify with that word. Of course we don't. We're talking about people who have lived longer than other people. That's it. 
Uh, yesterday I was chairing a summit on children's food up in Leeds and it's very interesting that children's food gets a lot of attention. Still haven't got it right, of course, but food for older people does not get as much attention. And I think that's, you know, one of the reasons that Angela put this evening together, Angela and Polly and colleagues have put this together this evening, because it tends to go invisible. Well, older people sometimes go invisible as well, don't they? Isn't that awful? Don't we, sorry, because we are all either older already or, I'll put my hand up to that, or going to be so at some point. So why is this invisibility thing happening? I just wanted to give a little bit of a flavour of my work. I'm not going to be here to talking about me by any means. And I do want to also say hello to the people who are at home. Hello. We often don't get noticed. So there are people watching us from home as well. So we'll be inviting questions from people at home as well. Um, as chief executive of an alliance of food and farming organisations, the alliance is what's important in that term. There's lots of people around the UK trying to tackle the kinds of things we're about to talk about this evening. And they are superstars one and all. And they, di they have to battle all the time with invisibility, which, and with invisibility comes lack of funding and comes a lack of support in policy processes and lack of support in institutional standards. I don't want to be the moan fest from <laughs> the stage, however. So I just want to talk about three things that we, and when I say we, the Alliance have worked on over the years. The Campaign for Better Hospital Food, bless Prue Leith for getting involved over the years as well, amazing. Um, has always been to say when somebody is in a vulnerable state within an institution, how can we make that a good experience? How can the food contribute to the wellness and the ability to live independently when you go home? So good hospitals do things like putting a red tray on the, bed, on the bedside with the food on it so that the nursing staff can identify who needs help eating food. Bad hospitals do not, so the person ends up not getting the help they need. I don't mean bad hospitals. What I mean is hospitals who don't prioritise food. In my world, that's a bad institution. That's one example. Local authorities supporting Meals and World Services. I'm talking to my colleague and friend, Neil Radia, who you know, has, has worked on food in care settings for years, trying to get the standards up. I'm sure you agree invisibility is a problem for the care sector as well. How do we make sure that the food that is in a care setting is convivial and fun and sociable and overcomes loneliness, gets people around the table and enjoying themselves as well as being, having the right nutrition? But I do want to talk a little bit about that idea of food during COVID-19. I was, uh, I'm looking back on it now with a slight horror, but my storytelling for the evening is being, we've got called in as representatives of the non-governmental organisations sector. My goodness, that's a mouthful. The charity sector. Uh, just before lockdown, the big meeting in number 10 with those wonderful, you know, walls covered in wood and, you know, all, all very posh, the bit where they then said protect, survive, save the NHS or whatever. So we were in that room before lockdown and we were being asked to say, what help will people need? Because you're the charity sector, you have the connections, you know, you know about this period as well. And we were like, you've never checked before, have you? Oh, OK, we're going to have to start with right from the beginning about how you connect with people. Uh, and there was a lot of talk about known vulnerabilities, which was, you know, the list of people who were going to have to shield. So all the, they'd gone to the NHS and said, who's got the conditions where somebody will have to stay indoors and not see anybody, and therefore they're going to get a box of food. So that was the government food box, which people may have remember, <laughs> that was circulated. Yes, you, you might well laugh. There was, you know, white bread and tins of beans. Great, lovely, uh, to survive for three years on. Hooray! Anyway, we did... <laughs> Don't get me started. OK, but in that meeting, I put my hand up and said, what about people who haven't got enough money? But that, was a, that, that hand is a political hand, because if you're talking to a government that doesn't want to think about food poverty as a vulnerability because of political reasons, that hand couldn't find a place. What I got from the deputy CMO at the time was, oh, that's something we'll think about. It took litigation to get the government to think about it. It took Marcus Rashford to make people think about food poverty. Because it, it, that goes invisible as well. The sorts of vulnerabilities we're talking about here on the stage are endemic. They're political. They are about our attitudes to older people. And there's lots of ageism in our society isn't there. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you for those yeses. Let's make this visible. This is something that Angela would like to do. That's why you brought this together. 
So can I, my final bit before I become the chair who asks polite questions rather than goes on, <laughs> although I am perfectly capable of going on, and I'm probably going to go to a curry house afterwards, if you would like to go on with me. <laughs> Because there's a lot of really nice curry houses down the side here. I'm serious. If anybody wants to go for a dinner afterwards, I know it's going to be a bit late, but can I describe what good food looks like and feels like? Imagine a plate. Let's have one of these circular tables as a plate. Good food is enjoyable, convivial, accessible. It's safe. You know where your next meal's coming from. It provides you with a sense of security. It meets your values. And your memories. I loved that. I didn't have that on my list. I love that. It helps you bring back memories for all of us. It looks great. It doesn't look awful. It's not a pile of gloop like I've seen being served to older people in institutions. It's dignified. If you need help with it, you get that help. It helps you feel and be independent. It's nutritious. Interestingly, that the thing we normally think about with food is that bit down the list, but it is obviously a really important part of it. It's nutritious. It meets the needs of your life stage, just as it would if you were a child, just as if it would if you're pregnant, all those things. It meets... I know you want to talk a bit about that later on. The one I also wanted to bring into, the, into here as well is it's fit for special occasions. Just because you're older doesn't mean you don't want to have a birthday or flirt with somebody. <laughs> I mean, for goodness sake, you know, that a special occasion is about also being able to invite people and look after people and feel that that's something where you connect. And perhaps my most important word is it builds connections with your body, with your friends, with your family. It doesn't mean you can't also have a really nice food on your own. You know, we don't want it to be lonely, but sometimes you would just want an egg sandwich, don't you, on your own without the <laughs> fuss of everybody else being around. But it, put the key in that is there's choice, isn't there, in that? And a lot of older people then end up in a situation where there isn't that choice. I wanted to present a positive vision of what food is, because that's what we all want. But some of the disabling conditions of our society are that those things get eroded or denied. So if you're outside that plate, now we're on this nice carpet then you're probably feeling disenfranchised, excluded and disabled by the system. So what can we do, that's the question for all of us this evening, to make people feel enfranchised, included and enabled around their food? I'm going to shut up now. No, I'm not really. I do say that. I won't fully. Oh, bless you. <laughs> I love you already. That's so nice. This is how we make things visible, because we care about it. Thank you. Really, really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to ask each of the speakers to introduce yourselves, and I'd like you to also answer the question on the way round of why do you care about good food for older people? From your perspective, who shall I start with? I'll oh, start with you. Is that all right, Tilly? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Is that all right, Tilly? Yeah. Um, nice to see so many faces, and it's so great to see such a diverse audience. Um, so I represent um, over 3,000 older people across Scotland. I work for a charity called Food Train, and we're probably one of the only organisations that work to support older people, particularly around food. Um, we were started by a marvellous lady um, nearly 28 years ago called Jean Mundell, and she realised that lots of her friends and peers are really struggling to access food, and it started in a town called Dumfries, and... Um, basically, older people are supported to get shopping and grocery delivery services, and now we cover all of mainland Scotland, um, providing that grocery delivery service support, but so much more about the holistic value of food and mental well-being. Um, but I actually lead our policy and parliamentary engagement work, um, and I particularly work on a project called the Eat Well, Age Well project. So for the past five years, we have been working to tackle malnutrition and food insecurity amongst older adults living at home in Scotland. Um, and actually, it's been a real battle. You keep saying the same things, and it's really exciting and great to hear, you know, it be on the stage today and be talking about this topic and to have such a diverse um, collection of people that are really interested and engaged in the conversation. And the question was... <laughs> <laughs> well, why do you care? Oh... Uh, well, I think food, as you've said, so many of those things, um, food is care and food is joy, food is social, food is so much. And actually, I often get asked, I'm 26, why are you working in this space? And I think everyone should be having these conversations, 
we should all care. We, it's a privilege to age and it's a privilege to enjoy food and have people to share food with, have all the laughter and joy and friendship. And I really believe that everyone should have that opportunity. Um, so I keep championing and advocating for these people and they're at the heart of everything I do and I represent them on the stage tonight. So yeah, Good that's people all across Scotland from you know, the Isle of Mull to central Glasgow. It's those people that we're talking about um, who would probably love to be in this room, but for whatever reason, it <laughs> can't be. So yeah, and remembering those and thinking about those people um, alongside us on this stage, not just us. I, I really like the fact that you've brought those people into this room. There's people who can't speak on a stage like this for whatever reason. We feel a responsibility. We were talking about this in the green room. We feel a responsibility to bring this. So let us call in the people who deserve the sport. Neil, I'd like to come to you. I'm going to do a random yeah, order so, so that we're just going along the line. So again, like Tilly, thank you so much for coming along tonight and listening to what we're doing. Um, eating for older people is such an important topic. Um, we don't talk about it enough in society. We should be talking about it more. And so, you know, thank you to the British Library for hosting tonight. Um, so my background, I do a lot of different work. <laughs> I've got lots of different hats on, um, not wearing them all tonight. But um, I'm a founder for a small social enterprise called Cake for Kindness. We, um, we basically we basically bring people together, we bake together, and we distribute those bakes to people who are experiencing homelessness. But I also do a lot of work around Meals on Wheels, so I'm a, on a voluntary basis. It's with the National Association of Care Catering, where I lead on uh, Meals on Wheels. I'm their Meals on Wheels lead. And the work we do there is around raising the profile for um, the Meals on Wheels service, lunch clubs, day centres, but also around raising standards as an association in care homes when it comes to food, the delivery of food, the nutritional side of food, you know, making sure that we're catering for everyone's specific dietary needs, um, you know, whether people require texture modified meals and making sure that they're presented well and it tastes good and it looks good and it's appetizing. Um, so from a, yeah, so from a, from a individual person, point of view. I do a lot of work with different food charities um, and um, I, think, I think for me food has always been a centre of my identity from a very young age. Um, you know from a family point of view you know I've grown up with my elders in the family, my grandparents, we've all lived in a very close community together um, and food has always been a really important factor of everything we do. Um, every celebration we have. Um, I was talking to somebody just yesterday about, you know, you could just, being a, you know, being a, a British Indian Gujarati person, you know, going into somebody's home just to drop, I don't know, a bag of potatoes, you weren't allowed to leave unless you had a, a meal. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and um, you know, it was, that was the culture I was brought up in. And so growing up, I've always had a keen interest in food. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have done a lot of traveling as well and going to a lot of third world countries and seeing the poverty around and where people haven't got access to food, to shelter, you know, and, and it just really drew, a, drew something within me to actually do something more as I'm growing older to um, represent marginalised communities and support them when it comes to food insecurity. And that's why I do a lot of work around Meals on Wheels, because it's, it's an area which, especially for older people, it doesn't get the airwaves that it deserves to get. Um, and, you know, I know we're going to be discussing it later on, you know, why is it? Why do older people and food don't get that airwaves, you know, we're going to be discussing it later on. Um, but that's, yeah, I can't remember. Have I answered your question? I think you so have. <laughs> so, so sorry, yeah. Babbling on there. No, it's not babbling. It's, it, it's beautiful, Neil. I'm going to come to Angela. Yep. Hi, everybody. I am Angela Clutton. I am a food writer. I write cookbooks. Um, and as Polly said in the introduction, I also have the great joy of being the co-director of The Food Season. 
And I'm hugely grateful to Polly and Melissa and the whole team of the British Library for giving space to this conversation. Um, because as everybody has said, it's not a conversation which gets too much space and it's one that desperately needs it. Uh, and it, the answer to why do I care is why I wanted to put this session together tonight in that like so many people, I have lived pretty much every aspect of what Dame Carroll has described as being the issues around the older community and food. Um, and it, as you were sort of talking it through about living at home and then being in hospital and being in a care home and nursing home, I was mentally sort of ticking off every one of those experiences that I had with, with my mother in my case, um, and how the food journey all the way through was such a fundamental part of what went well and what went absolutely terribly, and then happily for her, what went well again. Um, my, I'm going to talk a lot tonight about my story, and I hope you'll bear with me as I do it, because I'm sure, absolutely certain, there will be so many of you in the room and online who will also have elements or need the entire aspect of the story that you go, I've experienced that mm. too. And, th and this is the thing. So many of us have done or will do, and yet this is not the conversation that anybody really wants to think about. It's not where people want to put their time or their money or their energy, and it affects us all in one way or another. So we're trying to get that up the agenda. We're going to think about what the problems are, how they've arisen, and where there are good things happening too, because there's loads of great work happening. When I was researching how to put this together tonight, I came across so many people and I'm so delighted to have Tilly and Neil here because you are outstanding in what you do and you're exemplars for getting yeah, out yeah. there and doing it well. There, and there are lots of people who really, really care. And we, but we just have to kind of get more people thinking about it and more resource, more time, more energy because it, it's not all going to be negative about what the problems are. There's so much positive as well. But we just have to get up the agenda, like schools and like prisons and like hospitals, which I don't want to bump down. I just want to get this up there as well. Absolutely. Uh, hogging the floor for two more seconds myself. I just want to say, uh, I, I hope that I'm the only person you know who literally had a conversation about hospital food while I was having my caesarean. <laughs> <laughs> with the anaesthetist, I got him signed up to our campaign. Anyway, <laughs> well, they were busy with the actual, you know, the rough end, so I had to do something to get myself distracted. Um, Dame Carroll, you have talked to a certain extent already about why you care about it. You have also already been introduced. I wonder if I can come to you with a question about, because you're also president of the Royal College of Physicians, why GPs don't know more about food. You know, what, at the point of contact w with a professional, food seems to be quite invisible. You know, and they want to talk yeah, about, no, no, want to talk about health and nutrition. Um, you know. It's a very good question, Kath. But if you think about it, our GPs do not have time and have not been invested in what I will call public health. Yes. Because this is really part of the public health agenda. It's a bit like hospitals, you know, uh, they're not really, uh, we don't have a national health service, we have a national illness service because mm. we're always firefighting to cope with people's illnesses rather than all the stuff that would make them live longer, better and, and more healthily. So I suspect it, it, it is just that it is crowded out by all the other stuff that is on the agenda. I don't think it's an intention not to be interested. No, no, not at all. But, but it's interesting that at a point of contact where a lot of older people will be meeting somebody mm. who may be able to help. I mean, what, you said that you were very interested also in the what are the nutritional issues that face older uh, people. And well, I wonder whether you yeah, might talk a I little mean, bit what, about that. What really it, it interests me as you get older, and of course I've gone on that journey, um, you know, we all know, I think, that we will, physiologically, we lose muscle bulk. Our muscles don't, are not as strong. But you can actually, um, you, can, you can delay that for quite a long time. And in order to feed your muscles, if you like, and your connective tissue, the thing that holds you together, and your bones, you need good nutrition. You need protein. Um, and therefore, and, and of course, you need to be active. And I don't want anybody running the marathon, of course, um, as they get older, but we all can walk or swim 
or maybe bicycle. It doesn't matter what you do. But if you have a combination of a nutritious diet and you are really looking after that and you can combine that with keeping your musculoskeletal system working, they're the two essential things that can take you into a much better older age and allow you to enjoy it and go places and be part of society. I mean, the worst thing, I think, is to be in a position where as an older person, you, you are forced to be at home because you can't do anything else. You know, you're not fit enough to do it. And some of this is in our own gift. So keeping ourselves fit is, is some, well, quite a lot in our own gift. What we eat is also dependent on poverty and where we grew up. So, you know, I grew up in a house where our main food was bread and jam and bread and lard. I never eat jam. I will never eat jam again in my life. <laughs> you know, I ate it for years, but we didn't, we had protein once a week. Mm -hmm. That is not a way to build a healthy body for the future. So I know we're talking about the older person type, but this is a lifelong journey. So I am concerned that in order to lead a, 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 just an enjoyable older life, be able to do the things you want, it is good nutrition and keep moving. Can I just... Sorry. Yeah, of course, Angela. Um, sorry, I should say, I'm going to jump in and ask some questions as well because I'm not an expert in the way that these guys are, so I might ask them, I genuinely want to know something. Um, because I hear a lot, and I think maybe Tilly, you can jump in on this as well, about people on their own at home who lose interest in food and who may have eaten, in my personal situation with my mum, which I'm, I'm going to keep going on about, uh, only because it's my lived experience, that she had fed a family brilliantly for decades and then was widowed and over a, a quite a short period of time lost interest completely and it wasn't really to do with not having the wherewithal to do it i did that tesco online delivery every week to make sure there was food turning up which wasn't really being eaten is it is this a recurring thing that people lose interest when they're older and particularly on their own yeah definitely i mean widowhood is a key point in life where that there's a clear change in food practices um I completed my master's dissertation research looking at the impact of food practices in that particular group. And I remember a woman telling me about how she had no motivation and all she would cook was poached eggs. Wow. And I think it goes back to that. It's that motivation and desire to cook, but also the joy that you get from eating with others and cooking for someone else. Mm. And that's a big part of it, being able to give something. It's a gift of food as well. Um, and social isolation is a direct risk factor of malnutrition. So... And that plays a part in it when we, you know, when someone is sadly widowed, you've got grief, you've got such a change in daily practices. And um, I think it's a really important, we must, must do much more at that particular point in life. And how, what, 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 sorry. What, no, no, what, no. how, how, what, what would you say we must do much more? Well, what is the much more that could be done, that could be being done? Good question. I think there's a lot that could be done. I actually think it goes back to, a lot of things did historically exist. I think we'll go back to points around meals on wheels or lunch clubs or social eating opportunities, social spaces to engage in the community, but they've lost money. We've literally seen such a decline even just in the past three years since the start of the pandemic. And I will crucially say the pandemic is still happening. And I really want to make that clear in this conversation. There's lots of people who don't feel safe to be leaving their homes. And that's particularly profound amongst our members. And it's important to recognise that there's a real diverse mix of people amongst that category and different people have different needs. Um, but yeah, I think it is money, it plays a major role and we've got to see that investment in taking a preventative approach to health and recognising the social risk factors mm. of many different issues, illnesses, whatever you would like to frame it. Mm. I'd quite like to underline the word money because you talked about poverty and you're talking about money for the initiatives that can respond. I, I, would it not be nice to bring Neil in on exactly the same question that Angela asked? Yeah, can you ask, the, qu ask the question again, please? <laughs> I remember it now. <laughs> no, no, that's all right, that's all right. So, I mean, I think I think when it comes to food and food poverty and for older people, I think I have this conversation a lot with a lot of policymakers, um, a lot of different groups of people, and um, loneliness and social isolation really gets missed off the list when you're talking about food and older people and i mean i 
I, I go in, I, I do a lot of work around Meals on Wheels on a voluntary basis, but I make it a point of going out twice a year and going out for a day and delivering Meals on Wheels so I can see what's happening as well in the community. And, you know, I, I meet older people who are widowed, who can't get out of their homes as much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they say to me, you know, services like Meals on Wheels, it's, it, it helps them, it gives them that connection to meet one person, one friendly person every day um, and they know, you know, what time Mary's going to come and drop the meal. They know and they want to have a conversation with you because they're lonely. They're feeling isolated. And, you know, there's over, I think, 300,000 older people who can't physically get out of their homes mm -hmm. because of being frail, um, because they're, you know, they're, they're not just physically are not able to get out of their homes, may not be able to cook for themselves for whatever reason it may be, dementia, Alzheimer's, you know, um, being frail, you know, not, not being able to, I don't know, lift the saucepan, you know, because they're, they're, they're shaking. And having services like Meals on Wheels and lunch clubs in our society, in our communities, it's so, so, it's such an amazing service to have. And I think we, we talked about money and funding and Meals on Wheels has been on a decline in the UK. Mm. So... For those of you who aren't aware of Meals on Wheels, um, Meals on Wheels is basically a traditionally a hot meal being delivered on a daily basis to support independence for older people who want to remain in their own homes and live in their own homes for longer. It's a support mechanism and it, it's not only about a, a meal going to the, to the home, it's for a lot of older people. It's about that connection with that individual who's dropping that meal. It's, um, you know, when I go out on the Meals on Wheels runs, you know, the, the people we meet are saying to me, you know what, what would I do if I wasn't getting this meal coming to the home? Um, Neil, do you have any numbers about the, the, the number of Meals on Wheels services that are? Yeah, absolutely. So we, as an association, the National Association of Care Catering, did a research paper around how many top-tier local authorities were providing a Meals on Wheels service in the UK back in 2016. And the figure at that point was 68% of local authorities. We then did a research paper again in 2018 and it had dropped down to 42% of local authority top tier councils. And the reason they were being cut is because there's no statutory requirement to provide a Meals on Meals service in the community. And because there is no statutory service, social care funding that's going into the community isn't, money's not being ring fenced for food. I don't mean to be I'm going to get a bit emotional. Sorry, I do get emotional about this topic, but I will. Yes, it's all right, darling. <laughs> but, you know, I, <laughs> I, um, I mean, I was, you know, I always think about, like, what my grandmother said to me. And when I was younger, growing up, my grandmother said, in life, we need three things. We need warmth, we need shelter, and we need food in our bellies. And with what really irritates me is that the funding cuts are continuing to happen. And unless we get food on the top of the agenda for the government and for older people, it's not going to get any better, really. And the same goes for lunch clubs. Um, Post-pandemic, um, we're seeing lunch clubs shut everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, lack of funding, um, but also lack of volunteers. Okay, there are some places, you know, we do speak about, and there's a lot of older people who are still, we're still living in a pandemic, you know, and there's still a fear about the COVID. So, you know, volunteers have been lacking, but I was in a meeting last year with, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> not going to mention local authorities there, um, but they were shutting down their, their lunch clubs and again, a lunch club is a space for older people to come together, to, in to enjoy a meal together. If you're living in isolation or 
lonely at home and you're not able to leave the home, having a lunch club or a day centre in your community is a lifeline. Mm -hmm. And the conversation was around why they were closing down the lunch clubs in this specific area. And the reasoning was that there's not enough people, service users, older people, wanting to use the service. And <laughs> it's going to make you laugh. So I, I basically stepped in and said, look, we have just come out of a pandemic. We, as the younger generation, are still wondering at that time, is it safe to go out? So aren't older people going to be more, probably a little bit more reluctant mm -hmm. as well? Um, and secondly, I mean, I'd done a bit of research beforehand, but they had cut the uh, dialer rides. The budget had cut. So my argument was, you're not making it accessible for older people. Mm -hmm. The people who need the service for a lunch club or a day centre, who are at home, who can't get out of the house, who depend on a service of a day centre or lunch, lunch club, if you don't make it accessible for them to get to that place, how are they going to, how are they going to get there? And lunch clubs don't only provide food. It's also about, you know, I, I've been to lunch clubs where they do chair yoga. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Have it, anyone, <laughs> has anyone ever done chair yoga in here? It is amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I went to one place and they did chair zumba. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Honestly, it was, I was, I was. Oh, yeah, that's what Carol was saying about moving yeah. around. Absolutely. Amazing. But it's, it's again, food. It was food, the lunch club, the food that was bringing people together. And whilst having them together, it was helping to, you know, look after their well-being and seeing what other needs they may have to support them to live longer in their own homes. And I think, um, I think unless we get more money ring-fenced towards older people and food especially i don't know if it, i don't think it will change i'm really this is my I'm, I, this you, is it I, if, i'll be here all night meal. talking <laughs> we invited you to speak it's fine <laughs> tilly i want to come to you as well because you you know like this is what you are doing all the time so what you know what do you feel could be done to make the great stuff like you and neil are trying to do embedded supported funded normal yeah it's my bread and butter i suppose um without jam yeah <laughs> uh yeah so actually i've had that own personal experience in terms of the funding situation our glasgow branch um did not receive further funding from glasgow city council um, which has meant that over 300 older people have no means to physically access food. So there's obviously some people who rely on Meals and Wheels, but we've got people who want food to come to their homes, but they can't carry it, they can't get it home from the shop. And we've got a big proportion of people now who are without that support. And it's just absolutely diabolical and so disgusting that that's even allowed to happen. Um, but I think I feel quite positive and optimistic living in Scotland um, because... Last year, the Good Food Nation Act uh, passed um, through Parliament. I was involved in that all the way through um, from getting it into the table. It was shelved during the early stages of the pandemic, which was quite rightly necessary. Um, but we campaigned, perhaps I, should, I really <laughs> campaigned um, to get older people recognising that bill. And it was a real hard slog. But we managed to get some amendments through the bill, which I feel quite optimistic about that we might create a good food culture and I think one that I really like is that the Good Food Nation Act recognises pride and pleasure in food and I think that's what this comes back to it's about that enjoyment and it's not just about having something physically in front of you it's about everything else beyond the, the physical plate and that's really great that politicians are talking about that and having these conversations um, we also got social care uh, recognised in the bill so basically um, different organisations, different public bodies have to produce a food plan in Scotland. So they're working on the national food plan now and other organisations such as health boards. Um, and I'm sure many of you probably don't live in Scotland considering you're here in person, but um, health and social care is integrated in Scotland. Um, people have different views on that. But I think there's a lot of opportunity in terms of strengthening the role of food within the social care system. And we've got to do a lot more um, in, in 
in doing that. And I think policy, public policy plays a major role in that as a legal responsibility in terms of having that high level recognition. If it's at that high, as obviously it'd be good to also have it at Westminster as well as Holyrood, but it's really great that it's on the agenda. And I think that's the first step. As well as the Good for Nation Act, we also have a national care service going through Scottish Parliament. Um, so that would sit alongside the National Health Service and we're really championing to try and get food recognised within that bill so that the preventative role of food, person-centred care is really central to how people receive support. Um, as well as also things like people have support in the home in terms of maybe you know, a carer comes in and they might crave the meal. Maybe that's not ideal, but so many of our members get given cold sandwiches they have had just a packet of biscuits all day and that's all that's meant to make them live a happy, healthy life and go out and socialise and laugh and dance. You know, that's not going to work. Um, so getting that in the bill and also a human rights bill is coming through Scottish Parliament later this year. And we really hope that we can get right to food enshrined mm -hmm. in law because currently it's actually kind of crazy that we're sitting here today and the human right to food is not in law. Um, the power that that would maybe give us would be hopefully something. Um, but yeah, I think po public policy is crucial, but it's also about investment. Um, I think it's about investment in services that work. Um, we ran a, a seed funded project across Scotland to get people to test ideas. People have got so many brilliant ideas. They're doing so much brilliant stuff, but there's just no money. And one of my favourite was going to visit Dunbar Grammar School. And I think it goes back to what you were saying around the intergenerational work. There's so much potential around bringing some of these things together. We talked about the Children's Food Summit that happened earlier this week. Um, but at Dunbar Grammar School, the children cooked a meal for the older people in the community and they come in and share the meal together, share stories and conversation. And I just think there's so much brilliant stuff happening, but we need to put that investment in it. And we need to support people to be able to do things that they know work. And I think also it's important to recognise the geography Across the UK, there's so many different communities and we've got to have that flexibility in how we deliver a Good Food Nation vision, whether that's, um, as I mentioned, the small islands. You know, it's a completely different community and we've got to recognise that. It's quite easy when you're in London to be in that London bubble. But there's so many people who don't have that experience of ne negotiating food and we've got to get that to the policymakers. So I'd say going back to your question, public policy, I think, is crucial and that's why I work in this space. But... We've got to have money come alongside the policy, you know. The Good Food Nation Act is all well and good, but if they don't give us any money to deliver it, then it's not exactly going to be a Good Food Nation, is it? <laughs> Are people familiar with the Good Food Nation Act? Because I feel like it's a really important point that you're making. I mean, I'm really excited, and my voice is going down a little, because otherwise I'll be squeaky, because <laughs> I'm excited about this, because the, the conversation is going to change in Scotland, and you are going to get a voice. <laughs> Blooming great! How marvellous that you all have the tools and the platform. Do people know about the Good Food Nation Bill? No. Can we explain a little bit about it? Because I do think it's game-changing in Scotland. Hooray for Scotland! If you go back into the EU, I'm going to get a tartan passport. <laughs> right. Uh, you have to get independence first, obviously. But... Um, OK, so the Good Food Nation Bill, please correct me, because I'm going to do the very, you know, very short summary, which is the idea that there will be a duty on government to have a food strategy and deliver on it, a duty. That means that there's an accountability built into that so that people like your very good selves can bring along to it. Here, we've got this thing we need to do. We can call down resource because we will be delivering on that strategy, which you are accountable for delivering. So we can be partners in that. We have a place at the table as well as at the plate. We have a place at the finance table. We can also, if you don't do it, hold you to account for it. I laughingly mentioned litigation during COVID. We had to take the government to litigation, but the only statutory obligation on government around food, apart from safety, is for children, not for older people. So there's no statutory obligation to help older people eat well. Let that sink in for a moment. So we can't sue anybody, basically. We can't take any cases and say, this is not right, that the money's not being spent in the right way. So within Scotland, as you said, local plans also have to be made genius. At the moment, lots of local authorities, right, as I understand it from our colleagues in Scotland, are going around going, what do we have to write in our local plan? Because, you know, it's new. Well, great, because people like Neil and Patilli and, just, and you know, the Centre for Ageing Better can start helping to write that. Mm -hmm. This is what it means. Informed by practice. Informed by good lunch clubs. Informed by good services. 
not informed by a waste food for waste people approach, which is generally what's happening in this country at the moment. You know, let's give surplus food into food banks and let the problem go away. Very kind of people to run food banks, but that is not a dignified way, as my friends who run food banks roundly agree. In Wales, very interested in having a good food nation bill there to give those powers. In Northern Ireland, very interested too, don't have a government at the moment, bit of a problem, we can come back to that later. Hopefully many people will, I have Irish family, let's not get started on that. Westminster, national food strategy was put forward by Henry Dimbleby, completely ignored. Bits and pieces of it are surviving, we had him at the Children's Food Summit yesterday. You know, he put in a huge amount of effort to look at what a healthy and sustainable and fair food system would look like and what accountability frameworks could be put in place to make that happen. And it's been roundly ignored because it's inconvenient, isn't it? Remember the hand I put up? It's political as well because it's about where the money flows. Well, the money's not flowing to your good work and your good work and the things you care about and the Centre for Aging Better concerns at the moment. From your point perspective, Can I just add something yeah, about the Good Food Nation Bill? I think Please. what was really... So I also sit on the Scottish Food Coalition, which is a collection of civil society organisations. I think, yeah, there's a lot of... It could have been a lot better, and we had a lot more asks, but obviously it's exciting still. Um, and one of those things is we also got a food commission um, as part of that bill, so that independent scrutiny and... Nice steer is really crucial in terms of delivery. It's not just about the government marking their own homework. It's someone independently, to some extent, doing that. And that's kind of really exciting in relation to that. And I just wanted to add one more thing before, is alongside this, I've also been leading on work around uh, malnutrition. And we have got a short life working group on malnutrition, um, which the Minister for Public Health committed to, and those recommendations should come out later this year. I think that's really exciting, and how that feeds into some of this work and bringing it together in a league, like in the legislation. Um, and hopefully, we can then use that to sh the, bring it to other um, countries within the UK and say this is happening and this is working. Uh, but I don't want to jump too many. Steps. I know, but it's exciting. <laughs> it's so exciting. The notion of the right to food, our country. Well, our four countries have signed up to the notion of the right to food. That is the, abil you know, the ability to have access to affordable, healthy, nutritious food that meets cultural expectations. But we haven't enacted things that would make that true. So Scotland is doing that. Yeah, and actually we, I gave evidence to the UN and there will be asked specific questions um, the UK government on malnutrition and food security, um, which they have to respond to in the next two years yeah. um, so hopefully that could be yeah but two years is a long time when we've got people not yeah. having their food security realized but it took a movement as well as you said of the Scottish Food Coalition to get that visible didn't we say invisibility before to make it turn it into a political ask to make it very specific to say this is how it would help I wonder from the point of view Dame Carroll of the Centre so. for Aging Better you know this talk of rights this talk of accountability, there's a talk of money flows. Um, what do you think about all these things? Well, one thing we're really campaigning for is an older person's commissioner. Oh. Um, they have a very successful one in Wales. Um, uh, and it is in, in, I mean, it's in law. So, you know, that, that again, it, it, it has some power. And we think that would be, you know, if we could get that in England, then that person could take forward some of these things, you know. Um, what sort of powers would they have? What would they do? It's well, they could, you know, I think in, in, um, in Wales, um, they can really question government and hold government to account. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you take the Dimbleby report, which really should have been enacted, because yes. it was immensely sensible. Um, and really the thing we should go, they, they could really have a go about mm -hmm. something like that. So it, it is that ability to hold to account. Once you've, given, once you've decided as a government you're going to have a commissioner and you give them some power, well, then they can certainly hold you, hold you to account. So they might, for example, be able to do an inquiry into meals yeah. and wheel services yeah, yeah, decline yeah. or... Or certainly take up that cost. topic. Yeah, yeah, OK. Right, yeah. That's really helpful. Mm. What, what, would, what would help the, the care catering sector, Neil? You mean about... Uh, In no, the policy world, you know. I, I, think, um, I think with food, 
I mean, having commissioners is great, you know, holding accountable. I think, look, from, from the Mills and Wills side, um, if we're talking about from that side, I think it's first of all trying to establish who is responsible for providing that service, because there is no, like, from a local authority point of view, there is no statutory requirement for them. And a lot of discussions I have, because, um, you know, we were talking about um, Tilly and I, sorry, Tilly and I met up before, <laughs> before this um, uh, panel as well. Um, and we were talking about different interesting topics around older people and food. And, you know, from, from food, um, from malnutrition point of view, um, you know, it's affecting not only from a social care point of view, but it's also affecting the NHS. You know, um, we were talking about a, a word which we don't like to talk about, uh, bed blocking. Um, it's it's not yeah, I was just about to mention it. Were yeah, you? Yeah. <laughs> I could read your mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, should we assume that you, you don't, you know, we're not here to advocate the notion of good food for the purposes of freeing up beds. It's fine to use the phrase bed blocking so people okay. understand what it means. Right, everyone but knows. we know yeah. you're a nice person, so it's all right. <laughs> yeah, but, um, but, you know, I think it goes back to whose responsibility is it for food provision for older people. Um, mm, and in England... In Scotland, it's great, you know, and I, I was, Tilly was telling, telling me a lot about the work it's, they're doing. It's as good as everyone thinks I know, it is. I know, I know. <laughs> but, but certainly a lot more advanced than it is in England. Um, but I, I think that we need to find, find out whose responsibility it is. And, you know, it's great to go to central government and ask for more money or... But then, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've spoken to MPs and that, you know, we're trickling money into social care. We're putting more money into social care. You know, as taxpayers, we're paying more money <laughs> for social care. But it's hitting other social care um, uh, support mechanisms, but it's not touching food. Mm. And that's the problem, isn't it? It's, we, we need... We need to embed food into our society as being something that we... and, and have somebody responsible there for it. Um, and until we do that, we're, we're literally banging our heads against a brick wall. You know, I, from a Mills and Wheels point of view, when I first started um, looking into Mills and Wheels, you know, about 20-odd years ago, um, you know, there was, there was the whole all the local authorities were providing it. I have thought they were the ones responsible for Mills and Wills. But actually they weren't because, you know, we've, we've dropped down to less than 50%. We're, we're doing the study again this year. I'm expecting to be a Terrifying. lot less than that. Where do you um, think those people are ending up? You know, wh how are they then accessing food? Is it a food bank situation? So we've, we've had... So under the um, adult social care like mm -hmm. framework... You know, there is a bit about nutri providing nutrition and hydration. It's not statutory. But, again, it goes back to interpretation. And we're seeing local authorities, you know, and this is something we've been battling in our heads against. You know, it's about interpretation. So they shut down a service, and then they put a list of all the local providers in the area on their internet for older people to access. And our argument is, again, that's not making food accessible. Mm. Because, you know... You know, not all older people have computers at home. Not all older people probably know how to use it. And I think the pandemic has allowed a lot of people to learn how to use technology to communicate and to um, and build relationships, you know, and do Zooms and whatever else we were doing. But it's not the right solution for all older people. And, you know, having a list of you know, different providers on a, on a website is not the right way of doing things. And so unless we get somebody who is going to take responsibility for food mm -hmm. in our society, and, you know, it's not even saying that a local authority has to provide the meals and meal service or the lunch services themselves, you know, there are other ways of doing it. There's partnerships. There are some fantastic charities in England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, who are doing an immense job. And, you know, a local authority could reach out and work in partnership with these yes. charities yes, yes. and ensure that we've got some great social enterprises. You know, there's one in Hertfordshire that's doing a great job. There's one down in West Sussex. It's about partnership. It's working together as a society, you know, and 
that's what we need to be doing it's more the right, of. It's the right thing to do. The right thing to and do. And that's a really good reason to do it. An incredible reason to do it, obviously. But if you just think about it purely economically, if you take away all these services because there isn't enough money for them, people are going to end up in hospitals quicker and for longer periods of time. It's surely cheaper to run meals and wheels yeah, <laughs> than to have people just ending yes. up in hospitals so much quicker. I absolutely agree. And the people who save the money are different from the ones who'd have to spend the money. Yeah. So, and this is a, an interesting thing throughout. This is why I work on food systems, because to... it's very hard to know where to intervene and who will pay for it. You're coming in. Come. Yeah, I just, I think, yeah, having that whole system approach to food is really the direction we're heading. And that's why it's, I work with RSPB, for instance, on who, you know, you think of as a bird's charity, but, <laughs> you know, that's about land use. And that's so exciting to have those conversations. We've got to think, like we've got to take that whole systems approach and it can be really difficult to think about compromise and having those things about where we prioritise things. I was in a meeting just last week and I, I think we need a cabinet secretary for food systems, food, not just food, but food systems, you know, why is there for energy or housing? It's a, we need food to survive and yet it's not prioritised and we need someone to bring it together across different ministerial portfolios. And I think in Scotland, we do have a ministerial working group on food, but it meets fairly irregularly. But if someone had ownership and responsibility for how food, you know, to do with trade or farming, agriculture, health, social care, you know, school food, everything, there's just so much potential to see food as that tool. And I think that comes back to that, seeing it as, that, as a tool and what it can give us, as well as obviously being vital to survive. Um, and I don't think we've moved far enough the fact that we're talking about a national care service in scotland yet we're not really talking about food within that and i just think that is absolutely crazy and this is but it could be so transformative oh i so agree <laughs> kath anecdote number four sorry uh i gave evidence at a select committee once where i talked to the chair and said could you ask the civil servants who are about to come up on the stage who is responsible for ensuring that children and older people who have no money can be fed or can receive, have adequate you know, money or adequate food. And she said, yeah, sure. She, and it was, it was an absolute case in point of what you've just said. Literally, people were sitting there going, him, as in <laughs> not me. <laughs> or I don't know, that was the two responses, him or not me, but who, whoever him was at the other side, I'm not pointing at you, Neil, don't worry, <laughs> but whoever was the him here was going, well, it's not me, it's not him. And it was like some comedy show of pointing hands like this. It's like nobody will take accountability for this. Can I also tell Kath anecdote number five, which is Theresa Coffey, who, when, when at DWP, Department for Work and Pensions, literally the Secretary of State for the Social Security Safety Net, when she was asked in a select committee inquiry who is responsible for making sure people can eat. She said, that's DEFRA. Oh, she's now Secretary of State for DEFRA, and now she says it's not her. <laughs> so it, it, this thing gets passed around like a hot potato, not like a nice kind of hot potato where you bring it into the house and somebody gives you a nice meal in response to it, like your lovely story earlier. I think it's important to recognise that food security is not just about financial food security yeah. as well. And it's quite easy to get caught up in the food poverty conversation, and that's critical, but we're trying to move that argument when they're talking about food security and measuring food security as this multi-dimensional measure. Because I think if we solely focus on finance, that's absolutely important. You've got to have money in your pocket, but you've got to be able to have someone to eat it with. You've got to be able to get to the shops or have a means of um, accessing that food, be able to prepare it. And we've got to move that conversation. And I think that's how we'll maybe move the conversation forward in terms of recognising that preventative mm. value and role of food. Because um, if we always go back to money, I think it really frames it quite narrowly and ignores all the other things that we start to navigate as we age or have changing life experiences. And I absolutely agree we need to be changing the system in terms of food poverty perspective, but I think it's a different challenge. Of course. Um, do you think these... Do you I don't know if people know, but there was a food security summit at number 10 yesterday. Do we think any of these things were actually discussed at this level? I think no, roundly no. Look, somebody's shaking their head. Were you there? <laughs> we, funnily enough, we weren't invited, you know, this set of people to a food security summit because it it's about macro things, about balance of trade deficits and whether or not the NFU is representing members and what a trade deal's about. When it comes down to the experience of food and access to food and whether it reaches people, it's not 
thought of at a household or community level. And it's, I find it constantly interesting that it's not seen as that. So this voice was not heard at a National Food Security Summit. Mm. We were running a children's food summit at the same time, was coincidence, but it's interesting that's happening at the same time as now an older people's summit. We're the summit here. Kath, can I... Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, go, go on. I was no, going, no, well, I was going to go to talk about how do we get politicians and decision makers and funders and all these things to listen. But if that, you know, you might no, no, want go to... For it. Uh, you've got experience of dealing with decision makers. Saying, well, what should we do? <laughs> Even Henry Dimbleby couldn't get them to listen, and he did a damn fine job of trying. He did a very good report. Um, I've discovered over many years um, that you have to uh, on, get your evidence. So first of all, you need whatever you want to see happen mm -hmm. to make sure it is as evidence-based as you can make it so you can make a good case. And then you have to be able to sell that case within the framework of what the government is trying to do. So I'll give you a very practical example. I've recently done a big piece of work for the government on illicit drugs. So I wrote um, a report for them that has developed the new strategy on, uh, on illicit drugs in the country. What I wanted to tell them was, look, you've got a broken system. It's dreadful. You don't look after people who have an addiction. You treat them like second-class citizens or even worse than that. But I knew they'd give me no money for that. So I knew the government was very interested in a safer society, less crime. So I said to the prime minister, here's the evidence. You've got a broken system. If you would invest money in the treatment and recovery of those who are suffering from drug addiction, you'll have less murder, less serious acquisitive crime, and less people going to prison. £800 million. Pounds. <laughs> Good for you. But, but, uh, yeah, round of applause. But, Good for but, you. But the point, the point of that story is... You, you, you have to be able to align it. Whether you like it or not is irrelevant. You must align what you want to do with something that the government who is in charge at the time, doesn't matter what colour they are, you need to make it seem important for them to achieve something they want to do. Then they will flow with you. And, and that's quite tough. So I don't know what the argument would be with food, but I would think it would be you will have far less people falling, relying on the NH. I mean, there are many arguments you could make, isn't it? Yeah. You wouldn't and, say... And I would, I'd like to put into the ring as well, we can, as a movement, we've won some really big things. For example, Sustain, the organisation I run, coordinated the campaign for the sugary drinks tax, soft drinks yeah. industry levy, because exactly what you said because we said, look how much sugar is in the diet, look how much money you could raise that could be put into yeah. children's health promotion, and, and people want it because we worked for Jamie Oliver to prove that people didn't hate it. So, come you, on, you, it's easy. You, it's like you have to shimmy around these things to present them in a certain and, way. And therefore, you need to say, what would the government gain, preferably financially, because the Treasury is, in the end, the gatekeeper? Uh, what will they say? They were spending £19.2 billion pounds every year on drug addiction with everything that it cost. Yeah. They only spent 600 million on treatment. And, and so, yeah. but you do need your figures. So it'd be interesting to think what would be the argument with food and the elderly. And it would be wounded around. I think it is that thing about not clogging up the hospital. Exactly. With I think that's such an obvious and simple economic argument. If you, I, I, I really agree with Tilly that making it just about the economics is a slightly dangerous thing to do. But you're obviously so absolutely right. The government are going to look at that as being oh. such a motivator to enact change. So it's finding where their strategic intent is and then framing your argument to fit it with a time frame, you know, preferably some sort of milestone is on the way. Fantastic. I really appreciate you giving some advice like that. I want to come to the audience because you haven't yes. had a chance to speak yeah, yet. We Can should... I just raise one thing before yes, we of do, course. in case anyone wants to talk about this as well? We've talked a lot about uh, in the community and people at home and sort of uh, helping people at that stage of this journey, which Carol was talking, <laughs> taking us through at the very beginning. I just want to think just quickly about nursing homes mm -hmm. as well. Um, and we, you, uh, we were talking earlier about accountability and responsibility and to what degree 
it's a question. Do who has accountability of making people are well fed and nourished in a wider sense within the nursing home setups? Because I I have seen it. I'm sure many of us have seen it go very well and go very badly, and the mental health and the physical health impacts of the delivery is absolutely immense. But who who has responsibility? True accountability only in food for children. True accountability, yeah. as in for standards, quality. Obviously, there are lots of people doing good things and some standards in yeah. place. In hospitals, for example, it's written into the NHS standard contract that you have to have nutritious food that meets certain needs. Yeah. After nine years of campaigning to get it in there, you'd think it'd be normal. But no, it has, takes a lot of campaigning and to get that accountability built in. You know much more about care catering than I do. What would you say on to it about accountability? Yeah, I... I, I, I suppose my question isn't really about who has accountability. No. It's to what degree does, is there an understanding of how much it matters? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you know what, from a, from a care home perspective, I would say care home because that covers the whole, the brand. I mean, there are, we, we were talking about this before, you know, there are still obviously pockets where, you know, food and hydration, and, and I, we, we haven't spoken much about hydration in the aspect of food in this topic, but it's just as important, um, you know, where, where it's not, the standards aren't great, you know, and, and I know, in, in the back of house, we were just talking about it just now as well. Um, from a responsibility point of view, it, it goes back down to the the care the care homes, you know. And there are some, you know, there are some very good examples of work people are doing in care homes um, where the food is great. And unfortunately, and again, it comes down to I know sometimes we do have personal experience, and I know Angela has had personal experience where the food quality and um, and the presentation and the delivery wasn't superb. Um, uh, probably a nice word I for think, it. Yeah, so um, the, the one but that I think it goes... Like literally sausage rolls, chips and baked beans yeah. every day, every single day. And like as a one-off, that's quite nice. It's quite fun, you know, but ev every single day. Yeah, I, I remember you saying oh. <laughs> it was quite, quite, uh, quite horrific, actually. Um, but But there are some really good stuff happening as well in, in care homes and I, I think it all goes down to individual care homes you know the chefs you know they're, they're working under very very tight financial budgets but a lot of care homes are doing amazing jobs with their the food um, and you know it's all about person-centered care as well um, and that's really really important as we're growing older and and I really I think I think like speaking for myself anyway I'm not going to speak for anyone else but I'm really fussy eater, so God knows what I'm going to be like in a few <laughs> years' time when I have to get into a care home. But um, but I think it's yeah, the responsibility goes back to the care home, it goes back to the, the you know the the establishment, you know. And I think the more we talk about food, the more we put positive stories of what good should look like on social media, talk about it the more we can, the places that aren't doing a great job or may need that support because a lot of the care homes are having staffing issues like everywhere in the industry is um, or may not, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, they just may not have the support they need. Um, the more we talk about the good, the better we can make things be. And, and I think, you know, I know as an association, we do a lot of work around um, raising the standards, you know, and making sure that, you know, if you're receiving a texture modified meal, for example, that it looks good. It's not just load of it makes stuff so much on, it makes the so on the on the plate and mix around and absolutely. it looks like a brown blob. You wouldn't. It's not a dignified meal at all. And so the work we're doing as an association is about raising that standards, you know, getting more people to share good practices on social media. That's a powerful tool, social media. Um, and I think the more we talk about the good, it will make those who are providing the bad better. So is the answer to whose responsibility is? The answer is all of us. All of us, all absolutely. Of us to keep putting up the priority list. I, I would like to, to come to the audience because I yeah, really I like this. There is, the this is an, this is a very active, feeling audience, and there's a lovely hand gone up there. Is there, is there a microphone that can come 
Or is this the one that we should so hand out? <laughs> yeah, no, do no, it. Sorry, sorry we, need, we need to do it maybe, on the Maybe if, if you're able, if you would like to stand up, or no, maybe to... I think it needs to the online to audience won't hear it. Oh, because so, the online really people sorry. need to hear you as well. May so. I just read off one question that's come from the online audience first? Oh, that would be nice. The and then down. I'll come to you after that one. We'll, we'll yes, let's be who's been um, taking in It's a very heartfelt message from somebody called Rachel King, who works with a network of lunch clubs for older people in Hackney, and I believe some of her colleagues might be here in the room. But Rachel's very concerned about about cuts in funding, they're anticipating a big cut, and, and is looking basically for advice and for possible networks. I thought this was a really nice chance for, if there are some colleagues in the room, for people to be able to network around that and suggest other ways of, of finding funding. That's come through from online. So I'll Rachel King, if I can look at the camera, I'm a hackney girl, so do you want to meet up for coffee? Because <laughs> maybe we could talk about how to make that fundable because I think we should be standing up in our own communities as well as at national level. I don't want to take full responsibility for making our organisation fundable. <laughs> Are there other things that people, if anybody knows about possible funding, please do say so, and we would like to share that. But Rachel, if you want to get in touch, I'd be delighted to have a chat with you about what you want and that. Me, and me too. All right, you've got, <laughs> you've got coffee with me and Neil. <laughs> Great, oh, that's fun. <laughs> I think the funding situation is pretty dire for older people and food, and there's very little money around. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I really feel for you, Rachel, it's not a fun place to be right now. It's really challenging working in the charity sector. And I think we've got to think about all our colleagues mentally as well. It's really hard to keep going and keep fighting. So um, if anyone keeps raising that profile and recognising how important it is, I think that's really crucial in bringing food up the agenda and hopefully the money following, because it's really difficult when some of my colleagues didn't know if they had a job in two weeks' time, and yet they still kept going and delivering food and comforting people who were absolutely petrified. Um, so, yeah, I think everyone has a responsibility to, to talk, and hopefully the money might follow somehow. I think we need way. to do some advocacy with funders as well. There, were used, there was a report once called Where the Food Grants Go, and lots of them went to animal welfare, and very few of them went to older people. So you'll do all right if you're a dog but you won't do so all right if you're an older person. Now, it made me think perhaps we should do a campaign about uh, you know, pets for older people in order to get the food stuff in some way. <laughs> I mean, coming to your point about how do we package this in a way that uses what we've got to get it in and help raise the, before the, th the services disappear. I, I think with funding as well, it's not an overnight solution from a national point of view. It's going to take time. And my... For, for um, I'm so sorry, the the lady from Hackney, um, Rachel. Rachel, Rachel. My 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 advice would be: look, just please, just stick at it. Think outside the box as well when it comes to funding. Um, you know, I've what I've known, what I've got to know from the community over the pandemic and even after pandemic is, you know, we're we're all in this together. And actually, speaking with the local community, local advocacy groups. Um, you know, local businesses, you know, th 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 there's, there's always a solution out there, um, so don't be disheartened by it. Bless you. I, th I think in terms of funding, we were literally thrown money at us at the start of the pandemic. Yeah. Like, um, Scottish government were clearly like, how are these people going to get food? And we saw a 65% increase in demand and lots of money put there, and we were able to scale up m massively. That's like thousands of older people. Um, and so the systems exist and they can be massively increased if the money's invested and it's there. And I think it's, we've now seen that massive decline and it's yeah, yeah. pretty, yeah. But People are going invisible again. Yeah, exactly. Can I come to the lady who's waited patiently? You've got a microphone there. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's a couple of issues, really. Um, I ha have had problems with my digestion, so I've done quite a lot of research into it all. And I know that we're encouraged you know, now to eat as many different kinds of vegetables and spices and everything, which is what I do. But I am also aware that I have the means to be able to go and buy those things. And what worries me is that there is a huge inequality now that is getting worse in our society um, with people like me, who can go and buy and choose and go to the farmer's market and spend three times as much as anyone else, um, who, you know, might mean I'm, I'm healthier um, as I grow older. Um, uh, but there are lots of other people who don't have that choice. And the other thing is about packaging in supermarkets. I get absolutely cross and upset and sad 
about the fact that I live on my own now. My husband died 10 years ago. He had dementia, so I know a lot about hospital food and <laughs> um, meals on wheels and things. Um, but packaging is always for families yeah. or for couples. It is never for a single person. We're all trying to get rid of packaging because it's ending up in the sea and destroying the fish. Um, so why aren't we, why can't I go and buy two potatoes? I could do it with bananas, <laughs> but you know, I can't live off bananas forever. So there's two questions there really. How do we get commerce to actually cater for people's needs, but also how do we reverse this inequality, huge inequality that is happening currently? That, those are such massive and such important sorry, questions. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm aware we won't... No, well, don't be, not be sorry. I, you know, it's absolutely spot on. Who would like to pick on either of those things? Tilly will go for it. Oh, I didn't realise I said that, that so loudly. <laughs> I think getting supermarkets or not just supermarkets on board is so essential and we do work a lot with different supermarkets in terms of there's a lot of work happening around slow shopping and various things around allowing people to come into the space or we also run a one-to-one -one befriending service where maybe someone's helped go to the shop and I think that we're starting to move in that conversation I think we need to do engage. they want to have that conversation Tilly is there um, I think there is there is some engage and we do rely on the supermarkets a lot to like store our shopping like they do support us but I think we could go a lot further yeah. and I think lots of um there's a lot around social washing a term where they for instance say a child can eat for a pound yet none of their staff are paid well so it goes back to your second question around inequality I think um and I wish I had a magic wand and had an answer and I'm not sure what the solution really is um can I talk a bit about supermarkets because we do do some work on this I think they're rubbish on this, frankly. And I don't think it is necessarily something that will ever be on the agenda. What I think back to is my childhood of shopping in covered local authority markets. You know, I'd love it if this country had a covered local authority market in a supported market in every place. I will come to you so you don't have to keep your hand up. That's oh, right, yeah. Uh, uh, because that's a place where you can choose one potato and have a chat. And there's probably a cafe Absolutely. in there as well. Now, there's some markets are fantastic and they're still thriving around the country. We could have local authorities really interested in supporting that. There's one up. I'm trying to remember. There's this wonderful guy I met called, I'm going to say Johnny Vegas. His surname was Vegas, but his first name was not Johnny. Uh, but he was running an enormous market and he had a different day for different people. So he'd say on Tuesdays, this is an expensive posh farmer's market. On Wednesdays, it's the cheapest chips market. <laughs> on another day, it's older people on another day it's for students and he was putting in loads of effort into making therefore it more accessible to those different people he had busloads of people coming in to use that local authority market because the ones around him had stopped we've got a decline in our society with also greengrocers for goodness sake it's very difficult i mean we live in london so there's greengrocers everywhere but you go outside london there's some cities and towns that do not have greengrocers anymore i mean that's ridiculous that's like not having a pharmacy in my world you know, a greengrocer is a pharmacy or some other kind of retail outlet or a co-op or a Meals and Wheels service. You know, where is the food economy, the food system that, uh, that is more inherently accessible? Up, doesn't it? Yeah. We've talked about this so much tonight, I think, too. You've yeah. talked about it a lot. But just connecting all these things rather than thinking of them as separate bits, because everything you've just said would support so many facets about the food system and answer your question about you know, being able to buy two potatoes and answer some of the socialisation and loneliness stuff. It was like, maybe markets, yeah, maybe they are. There's the a wonderful answer. author who has spoken on this same stage. I was, I was very privileged to chair her as well. I'm going, of course, to mention Carolyn Steele, Polly. Uh, so C Carolyn Steele is a friend of mine who writes about food places. So a food place, she calls it sitopia rather than mm. utopia, a food place, in which there's all this plurality of stuff going on in which you find life through the food interactions you have in a place. Now, in, in London, where we're living, many of us, not everyone, I'm not assuming that, there is, no, no you're definitely not, having come down from Edinburgh, but, uh, but the, the idea of there being more community gardens, there being of more lunch clubs, there being um, more different ways of interacting with food traders of different types, more uh, convivial, connected-based foods. You know, that, 
that is a growing movement, actually. There are 80 places in the UK that are a part of the Sustainable Food Places Network who are trying to sort of bring that into action. That requires support in its own right. The National Food Strategy had one line on it. We want to take that line and expand it into paragraphs of this is an accountable thing, local authorities should be doing this, because that's how you get the money flows and the accountability and the joy and the passion. And also Neil and Tilly get put on a pedestal and go, you do great things. Let's give you the right funding. Do you need any other support? Imagine that kind of conversation happening everywhere. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I do want to come to the lady who had so patiently had your hand up for too, so long. Do you want a microphone coming over you? Because we do need the people at home to be able to hear. Have you? Oh, Neil, what a gentleman. You were about to rush down. I was, yeah. You were about to rush down, you're such a gent. So it's the lady in the second row, just behind Polly. Um, I'm glad you've brought in the supermarkets because that was going to be part of what I wanted to speak about. Um, but also, I think it's absolutely essential that you get the, the support of farmers in whatever you are doing. Yep. Our government does not currently support farmers. Did you know, for example, that the people who produce apples in this country are not now producing apples. Yep. It's not economical for yep. them to produce apples, and many of those apple farms have gone out of business. And yet we can still turn to the rest of the world and import food at a great cost, both in terms of energy uh, and green, being green, and in physical money by importing goods. We should be growing more at home, and we should be supporting our farmers. That's my point, and the only way that that's going to change is by everybody voting in a different government yeah. next time. Yeah, yeah. Because it is a highly political and a highly charged, for me anyway, a highly charged question. This government thinks about nothing to do with serving the people. It thinks about serving itself and the people who are very wealthy in this country. And there are very, very many very wealthy people in this country, and they all take their business outside this country to the Cayman Islands, and they're, you know, they don't pay their taxes. How many people buy from Amazon all the time? They don't pay their taxes. You can do it. You've just got to stop using those people. It's very easy. And then my, my last point is to bring together a society. We don't have community groups. People don't live in communities anymore. On my street, until fairly recently, I've been able to say good morning and get a reply from about five people. When I walk along my street, I smile at people and say good morning to them. Everybody can do that. It costs nothing. I even say good morning to the grumpy old bugger with his dog <laughs> who looks at me like i am you know, got green eyes, uh, green uh, things sticking out of my head. I'm, but honestly, totally you can do wonderful. a lot just we by can. saying good morning to people. I am being told that we need to draw to a close. I'm not trying to shut you down. I want, I want to thank you, though. I run a charity, so I'm not allowed to be party political. But can I just go... <laughs> Bec thank you. It's meant to be received. So I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry that we're not going to be able to come to more questions now because apparently the lights are going to go down and they're going to kick us out at 8.30. <laughs> so can I just raise this hand and say what we said at the beginning, that it is such a deeply political thing that when we get together and talk about resource flows, money, to help wonderful people like these guys do the things that they need to do at a local level, then it starts to work. Having the structures, the strategies, the policies at the top that allow that money flow and that you can hold people accountable for so that your voice gets hold, First Minister of Scotland. That's going to be your next job. Uh, I, I, I deeply appreciate that we've had this platform. And what happens next is going to be, of course, the question we care about. So there are campaigns going on around it. There are people that are needing funding. There, there are, as a Good Food Nation bill in Scotland, we need one in Westminster. We probably won't get one that one for years. What about in Wales? Let's get that one next. Embarrass the hell out of Westminster for not having it. Those are the kinds of things it would be wonderful to continue that dialogue with you, with friends, with people who, who might be in, in positions of influence. Can I come to our wonderful colleagues from the British Library and say, is there anything more that needs to be said before we close? As, as a life member of the British Library, I have to say it's a great privilege to sit on this stage as well. Thank you very much.
No, I was going to say a few words, but have you... I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> that was absolutely fantastic. Really moving. It was a privilege to hear those conversations. I know that this is the beginning of a conversation. There were loads more questions we could have heard from you for much, much longer. Thank you for sharing your amazing expertise, experience, authority. All of you have brought this issue to the fore, and I think everybody here can take something from tonight and then think about how they can make a difference, be heard, uh, impact uh, thinking about a local council, like government, there's all sorts of things that people can do. I think Tilly obviously needs to be Prime Minister. That's an <laughs> first obvious... Minister. First Minister. <laughs> yeah, sorry, First Either Minister. Either is fine. <laughs> no, Either actually. is absolutely fine. Do you know what? Uh, yes. I think we can have Commissioner of Food. I mean, there's all sorts of things we need to do here. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for being an audience who's come along to hear and to be part of this evening and to be part of this conversation, which so needs to be heard. Uh, do think about the food season. There are lots of other wonderful events coming up we'd love to see you again but mostly can we thank this thank this amazing panel and kath for masterful brilliant chairing thank Thanks. you so much <laughs>